And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Mark B. Lee. I'm the ambassador for uh, Space uh, Celestis Memorials uh, Space Flight. I want to make everyone aware at this time, we are broadcasting on YouTube, our, U our Facebook channels. Hopefully, we're still running there uh, and on Twitter. So there's a number of places that you can find us. If there's any problems whatsoever, please notify us or our staff who will be monitoring this broadcast and they'll be able to assist you. Not only that, this broadcast is recorded, so you are able to watch this at a later time to get all of the pertinent information that you have during uh, this broadcast. We have another launch coming up. This is another one of our mission briefings, and this is very, very important for all of our members to watch, listen, uh, and take notes. You are able to ask questions during this broadcast, and our team is here to answer uh, any that you may have, and I'm sure there are, there are a number of them. We'll make sure that we clarify any uh, uh, um, issues or information that we are bringing to you during this broadcast. So please be very, very uh, vocal in terms of anything that you may not understand. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring up our CEO, Charles Chaper, who will be uh, inviting you to uh, our launch uh, out in New Mexico. And he's will answer any question you may have. But in the meantime, he's going to go ahead and basically do a rundown for you. Uh, Charles, how are you doing today, sir? Doing good. Doing good. Thank you. Excellent. It's more exciting times coming up. I'm really happy uh, another launch is nearby. So uh, we'll go ahead and start off with this. And can you tell us a little bit of what to expect? Uh, sure. Um, well, we're about to three weeks away. 19th Memorial Space Flight Mission. Um, and the coming mission is uh, named the Aurora Flight, and we will be launching from Spaceport America in New Mexico, in southern New Mexico. Our headquarters city for the launch is Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, this will be one of our Earthrise services. Uh, I believe we have around uh, 120 participants on board, and we've sent invitations to all of our family members to join us for the launch, which is, of course, uh, one of the elements of completing the memorial service that we offer. Not only do we offer the destination uh, for cremated remains or DNA, 
going to space, we offer also offer the experience, the memorial experience of being um, uh, part of a real space mission. So for Aurora, the uh, three-day event kicks off on uh, November 28th uh, with registration at our headquarters hotel, the Spring Hill Suites Marriott in Las Cruces, and then moves into the 29th where we have three events scheduled. It'll be a full day. In the morning will be a, a trip out to Spaceport America and um, uh, an up-close briefing of the launch facility and the launch pad tour of uh, the rocket that uh, folks' loved ones will be on board. Uh, that is a very um, interesting and um, unique um, opportunity for people to get really right up next to the vehicle, the uh, control center, everything. It's a great tour. And we're very appreciative of Up Aerospace being our hosts for it. We then come back to Las Cruces and, and uh, everybody has a few hours until uh, the afternoon and evenings event, which are at the Las Cruces Convention Center. And that will be our memorial service and our uh, pre-flight reception. And uh, highlights of our memorial service will be many, but it's basically an opportunity for family members to remember loved ones aboard. We also will have um, a guest speaker at the memorial service, uh, excuse me, space shuttle astronaut, Mike Mullane, more on him in a little bit. And then uh, the next morning, uh, oh, dark 30, we bus out to the launch site uh, and we wait around a little bit. Sun, right, usually right at sunrise, uh, the liftoff occurs. And um, it's an exciting, it's unlike the rockets that you see flying out of Cape Canaveral. These are, are very, very powerful and fast uh, rockets that, that we fly. Um, so that's the, that's the event. Uh, if you are interested in attending, events.celestis.com is where you go to learn more and to uh, uh, purchase your tickets to attend. There are no private autos allowed at the Spaceport America. So if you want to go, you have to go with us and we'll, we'll welcome uh, many, many families uh, to that launch. Um, just a real quick rundown on our other missions that are in the queue. We announced, uh, I guess last month that the Tranquility Lunar Mission and Enterprise Voyager Mission has now been scheduled by, uh, ULA, United Launch Alliance, our provider, uh, on their Vulcan rocket for no earlier than February 15th of next year. So um, set, your, set your calendars appropriately and stay in touch with us because uh, as we get near the launch, the launch date <clears throat> gets more certain. We always post uh, launch dates on our website first and also um, send out communications to the family members to make sure they're aware of launch dates. So that's Tranquility and Enterprise. Also currently scheduled for that same day, which is, I'm not too concerned about it because that won't happen, is our next Earth orbital <clears throat> mission called Excelsior, which is uh, launching on a Falcon 9 rocket to Earth orbit. And again, scheduled for February 15th. 
So we're, we're in the midst of a run of a lot of missions. I'm sure that many of the folks that see this <coughs> are interested in their specific mission. And uh, of course, we have a variety of platforms and newsletters and uh, email and you name it that we're happy to um, keep everybody up to date. We stay in close touch with all of our providers and we only publish launch dates that have um, been uh, provided by them so that there's uh, minimal uh, confusion in the process. Okay, I think, you know, that we've got a, a heavy duty topic and some interesting stuff to go through tonight. So I think I'll leave it at that for the um, uh, mission updates. But uh, it's exciting. We're in the midst of uh, doing five missions in 12 months or four missions in five months. So it's, um, it's an exciting time for us at Celestis. I have to remember to unmute mute myself. I try to politely mute Sing myself. Hey, I know. I say, hey, hey, over here. Uh, uh, go Astro. No, <laughs> anyway, so um, I, I, I mute myself just out of politeness. So you, so everyone, so you don't hear any background noise or anything from me. The moving of the Enterprise flight, am I to understand that we are now looking at three flights in February or two? Well, two rockets. Three missions. Got it. Because one of those missions encompasses one of those one flights encompasses two remissions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so I got it this time. Uh, once again, guys, if you're joining us, if you haven't found us on Facebook, go on Facebook and find us. We're on Twitter. Go to our Twitter account and find us. Go to YouTube. We're on YouTube where you can find us. Uh, you can ask questions at any time our staff is on board watching the show as, as well as us and we have everything and anything that you you need answered we'll go ahead and accommodate uh charlie so where are we headed to now where what where would you like to go to for the for doing this broadcast now oh well thanks I, what we said we were going to talk about is um how we've served astronauts over the years mm -hmm. and i'd like to bring in our director of content and uh resident space hipster uh, influencer, <laughs> Emily Carney, to kind of help us through that discussion. I'll do a little background, but Emily is our designated astronaut interactor at, uh, at our launches and is also just uh, uh, knows many, many of the, of the astronauts and can give us some insight as well as uh, we're going to have a, an interview that she conducted with uh, our speaker at the Aurora flight, astronaut Mike Mullane. So I think we'll talk about astronauts, and I, I'll kick it off for just a little bit of discussion. And that is when I first thought about astronauts and Celestis, we were born out of an astronaut's imagination. I, I should start with that by saying that the reason that we're doing what we're doing today is my previous boss in the commercial rocket business, Deke Slayton, who was a legendary national hero, one of the original Mercury astronauts, but also just the, uh, the guy all of them looked up to. Um, Deke was an amazing <laughs> man. When he retired, he came and worked for our company, Space Services, Inc. of America. And while he, as, as the president, he conducted our successful Conestoga One launch. While he was president, he was approached by three people from um, Merritt Island in Melbourne, Florida, two of whom were funeral directors and one of whom was a um, Kennedy Space Center uh, engineer. And I guess they were golfing buddies or drinking buddies or what, they all knew each other, they were a clique. And I don't know how they hatched the original idea for Celestis, but they indeed did. And uh, they 
had it all figured out and they came to Deke and said, we need to buy a rocket. And Deke was in the rocket selling mode then. And so he heard about the idea and just glommed onto it immediately, just loved it, thought it was perfect. Uh, wow. Really simple payload fly, just all kinds of things. So he became really the face of, of the mid 1980s Celestis, F, and they called themselves the Celestis Group of Melbourne, Florida. So it was really all Deke's um, uh, branding, his personal branding on this effort. That it, it was a very big deal when it was announced in the early 1980s. Uh, Johnny Carson mentioned it. We got media all over the world. I can remember um, going out for lunch and I'd come back and there were 50 while you were out messages. How do I do this? You know, in, in any event, great idea. Probably gestated a bit before its time. Didn't ultimately get to the launch pad, but it was really out of that effort led by an astronaut that uh, um, kicked us into where we are today. If you fast forward to when we were first starting in the, in the 19, late, mid to late 1990s, then uh, the notion of um, flying astronauts, would they be interested really hit me as why would they want to do that because they've already been there right it, that mm -hmm. that was my thought if you've already gone while you're alive do you really need because at the time my thinking was perhaps less inclusive than it is now but at the time it was viewed as go to space for your memorial service because you could never go there while you were alive and, uh, but I was quickly disabused of that notion by the, uh, the widow of our first astronaut uh, who we flew, Gordon Cooper. Again, Gordo, another member of the Mercury 7, legendary in, in his own way. His wife, Susan Cooper, just kind of slapped me silly and said, what are you talking about? Gordo loved to fly. <laughs> if I have a chance to give him another flight, I'd be crazy not to do it. And yeah. that kind of got me thinking, you know, oh, maybe maybe I was wrong. Maybe this does have appeal. And subsequently, yeah. we've, we've, we've flown Bill Pogue, the uh, Skylab astronaut. We are getting ready to fly the Apollo astronaut, um, who didn't make it on Apollo, but nevertheless was an Apollo astronaut, Dr. Phil Chapman. And so this whole notion of we serve astronauts, which is, of course, completely logical. I'm sure any number of Navy officers get scattered at sea as, as yeah. their tribute. So the fact that we have fewer astronauts and, and uh, uh but the, I, the motivation is exactly the same. So we continue to provide that service for anyone that's been fortunate enough to, to get to space. Another aspect of Celestis and astronauts is that we find that they're the best communicators to our families about what it might be like for their families to experience Earth orbit space. And so we bring in at, at all of our uh, missions now, someone who's been there, who speaks the language, who's experienced what my friend and our one of our previous guests, Dr. Frank White, has labeled the overview effect, which is the profound change in who you are and how you think and all that you get by viewing Earth from space. And in fact, I, I think I've mentioned on some earlier versions of this that Frank noticed that our families 
are having what he labeled kind of the reverse overview effect when they see their loved ones leaving Earth for space. It's that deeply and profoundly affecting um, experience. So there's an obvious natural nexus between what we do and the folks that uh, find their way um, off the planet. And um, it's cool to be providing services for them. It's also very cool to get to meet many of them. I've worked with some, I've, uh, but I've not met all of them. And just have them share with our families uh, uh, what they experienced the day before, they share it the day before, their family, their loved ones about to, to, to travel in space. So that's kind of the intro to the, to the topic. And I'm gonna hand the, the microphone virtually over to Emily uh, to talk a little bit about her thoughts and reflections, but also to lead us into the interview that she did with our guest speaker, um, uh, Mike Mullane. Yeah, well, um, once again, th thanks for having me on uh, the live stream tonight. Um, and I, I really wanted to sort of reiterate, um, you talked about Deke Slayton, you know, he was the, you know, one of the founding fathers of Space Services, Inc., and really one of the founding fathers of the, the Celestis idea. And I, I think it's fitting that one of the United States, states like space flight pioneers, he was one of the first astronauts ever, you know, I mean, Granted, he didn't fly till 1975, but he had a big management role, which was really important. You know, and he was very well admired by his colleagues and other people he worked with out even outside of NASA. And I just think it's appropriate to talk, you know, and salute him a little bit because not only his role as an astronaut, but his role in really beginning Memorial Space Flights. Uh, that was really his big vision and, and Celestius really fulfilled it. So uh, I did want to mention that and um, how we are. I never met Deke Slayton, but I'm very grateful to his example. Um, an another thing I'd like to talk about, and Charles mentioned it a little bit, is um, we've, we have had uh, uh, several astronauts speak at um, our, our events. Um, and the reason really, there's a few reasons why we've done this. Obviously, it's because they can communicate. As Charles said, they're great communicators. Um, they can communicate to families, you know, what it's actually like to go to space, what it feels like, what the sensation of experiencing microgravity is going to feel like, um, you know, because th there's not really, if you tally the numbers up, there are a few, a few hundred people who's been, who've been to space. That's not many. So it's really incredible when you can, you know, talk to somebody or hear from somebody who's actually been in that situation where they can say, yeah, I've experienced this. This is exactly what it's like. And this is what your loved one is going to experience up there. And also another reason why, you know, a, a lot of the reason is um, we bring on astronauts as well is, is another thing that Charles brought up is the overview effect. A lot of astronauts are forever changed by seeing our planet. Um, you know, they start to realize that Earth is not divided it's really, you know, there's a lot of connected land masses. There aren't any borders, um, you know, and they come back with really a new perspective on, you know, how to live on the planet. Um, and as Frank White mentioned, he, he wrote a great article, I think, on Vice, on the website Vice, about how um, a lot of Celestia's families experience a similar kind of overview effect, you know, just by you know, being able to see their loved one go to space. I mean, that's an experience that not many people have, you know, undergone. And it, it, it can be transformative, I think, for people. So, um, but yeah, we've had several astronauts speak at our events. Um, some past guest speakers have include um, space shuttle astronauts, including John McBride, uh, Winston Scott, Nicole Stott, and Don Thomas. Um, and also I wanted to bring up... Um, I hope I'm not, I did publish this on the blog, so I don't think it's premature in discussing it, but um, next year during the Tranquility Flight, which is uh, due to fly in early 2023, we're going to have Fred Hayes speak at that one. And Fred Hayes is, 
an, an Apollo legend. Um, many of us know him. He, he's a great guy as well as a legendary astronaut. Um, and and everybody who's going to be at that event, who's going to be able to meet him, you're really in for a treat. That's going to be awesome. But um, before we get to the interview, the uh, I wanted to talk about Mike Mullane, who's also awesome to meet. And our families from the Aurora flight are really going to love meeting him. He's a awesome guy. Um, he's been a friend to the group that I run, Space Hipsters, for a long time. Uh, and we love him. He's amazing. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Mike Mullane, who will be speaking at the Aurora Flight um, Memorial Service. Uh, Mike Mullane is a three-time shuttle astronaut. He was uh, brought on as an astronaut candidate in 1978 uh, to the uh, the 35 New Guys astronaut class, named that because there were 35 of them. And um, a thing I want to mention, too, is that class was really the first astronaut class that reflected normal society you know it had six women in it it had two uh three african-american astronauts it had an asian american it was the first class that really looked like america previously it had been mainly you know upper middle class white males for apollo so um it was really the first astronaut class that you know they nasa really went out of its way to recruit with nichelle nichols who's on our enterprise flight to recruit people that really look like America. So that's something notable, but he was um, hired in 1978. Um, he is a West Point graduate, and he was in the Air Force, like a lot of astronauts. He flew on three missions. He flew on uh, Discovery's first mission, which was STS-41D. Uh, he also flew on STS-27 and STS-36. Um, although he did retire, I think in 91, 1991, um, he has written an amazing book. If a lot of you may have read it, if you haven't read it yet, uh, you have the opportunity. If you go to the Aurora flight um, events, he will have copies of it uh, for sale. But he has a book called Writing Rockets, which discusses um, all of his experiences, you know, becoming an astronaut, working with alongside women astronauts for the first time. There weren't any women astronauts, so it was kind of a learning curve for him. And it's really a fantastic book. It, it captures that time really beautifully. And um, I think a lot of you will admire it. But um, anyway, so without further ado, I, I would like to uh, we should probably uh, let's run the Mike Mullane video. I said whatever. Whatever you need is fine. All right. So let's set the scene. Um, what got you interested in, in space flight as a youngster? And I know you used to build uh, model rockets. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> well, going back, I was a child of the space race. Actually, it predates that. My dad was a World War II aviator. Uh, I was born three weeks after World War II ended and, and grew up with the uh, his uh, stories of World War II and the, uh, the Hollywood was churning out these movies, 1950s movies on the heroics of our airmen in World War II. And uh, here I was this impressionable five, six year old, seven year old boy. Uh, so I wanted to be a I wanted to be a fighter pilot, uh, even at a very young age. And then uh, Sputnik was launched and I was 14 years old when that happened. I'm sorry, I was 12 years old when that happened. And that. And then it, being a fighter pilot didn't seem to do it. I wanted to be an astronaut at that point. I wanted to be a John Glenn or an Alan Shepard, <clears throat> excuse me, and ride rockets into space. So I was very, I was all into the space program uh, with the space race. Growing up in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the time, there was a vast desert right outside my door. Uh, so I got really interested in homemade rockets. Uh, uh, back in that day, though, when I say homemade rockets, they're not like what you get nowadays at the hobby stores made of cardboard and balsa wood. I'm talking about getting steel tubing and, and welded fins and mixing up uh, very dangerous chemicals as <laughs> propellant. In fact, as I joke, I say I was uh, experimenting with homemade rockets. It wasn't rockets. It was pipe bombs with fins is what it was. Uh, very dangerous looking back on it. Of course, when you're a teenager, you never think about that. So uh, that was uh, my early interest in the in space. Uh, I did science fair projects on how rockets might parachute back to Earth from space. I read everything there was to read about the space race. 
and uh, aim my career toward, uh, well, getting into the space program in some matter. I mean, I wanted to be an astronaut, but so did every other kid in the country. Uh, but I definitely was focused on aviation and space. I uh, wanted to go to the Air Force Academy. When I graduated from high school, I could not get into the Air Force Academy. I ended up going to West Point, uh, which doesn't, you know, West Point accepted me. And as I joke, that doesn't say a lot about West Point. But uh, at any rate, uh, took my commission in the Air Force and I had a career there that ultimately uh, gave me the credentials, graduate school, uh, master's degree in aeronautical engineering, uh, some other schools along the way that made me competitive when NASA announced they were selecting astronauts for the shuttle program. Didn't guarantee I'd be an astronaut, it just made me competitive to put, a, put an application in. All right, and that that really uh, is a good transition to our next question. The next question that I've got: um, What kind of roles did you fulfill before you were able to be accepted to that astronaut class? Well, I, well, I went into the Air Force. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Could not be. It turned out my eyesight was too poor, uh, so I ended up flying in the back seat of fighter aircraft, uh, the F four Phantom. Uh, some people might be familiar with that. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I was a goose. If you saw a Top Gun, Maverick and Goose, I was a goose flying in the backseat of these uh, Phantom jets. I, uh, after some initial training, I went to went to uh, Vietnam. There, I was flying in the backseat of the reconnaissance version of that aircraft. Uh, our mission was to fly uh, very fast, at low altitude over enemy targets, filming enemy targets. And uh, so I did that over there in Vietnam. Uh, then spent four years after that in England uh, with the uh, NATO Cold War forces, the Air Force uh, over there. Uh, then from there, I went and got out. Uh, this was a critical uh, moment in my career, uh, looking back on it as far as being qualified to compete to be an astronaut, is after my uh, England tour, I went back to graduate school and got a master's degree in aeronautical engineering. Uh, then from there, I ended up in another school, the backseater course, a test pilot school. That's called Flight Test Engineer School. Uh, and then graduated from that and was assigned uh, to doing some weapons testing uh, with aircraft at uh, Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. And when NASA announced they were selecting astronauts for the shuttle program, uh, I put my application in and was fortunate enough to get selected. Awesome. Now let's uh, talk a little bit about when you were selected to become an astronaut. Um, tell us a little bit about your your training to become an astronaut. And do you have any sort of amusing stories from that period? Probably a oh, lot of amusing stories. <laughs> a lot of amusing stories. I'm not sure I can tell any. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first, when we got selected, uh, let me just talk about the training because NASA does have a world-class training program. Uh, if it's possible to simulate it, they simulate it. Uh, so uh, we had a simulator, obviously, for the shuttle. We start, though, very basic. They teach us individual systems. They call it single system trainers, where you learn about the hydraulic system, and then you learn about the electrical system and the environmental control system. And you learn all of these individual systems. And then the, eventually, you graduate into being able to get in with a with a crew, just a training crew, and get in uh, the rest of you know astronauts who are training, uh, end up in a simulator that uh, from the inside looks just like a a space shuttle, all the switches and displays and everything doesn't look anything like a shuttle from the outside. It's just a box, but in a, in a hangar in in Johnson Space Center. But at any rate, it works. All the responses are as if uh, you were actually in a in a space shuttle. And they would uh, introduce uh, malfunctions. Uh, we would have to learn how to respond to those malfunctions. And then eventually there would be integrated simulations where not only were you being trained inside that simulator, but also you were tied in with mission control and they were being trained simultaneously. So they were seeing the malfunctions just as if we're in orbit, uh, just like a team reacting to these malfunctions and learning how to how to overcome problems to maintain, uh, make sure we are able to be safe at first, but also uh, to press ahead and get the mission done. So it's a very uh, structured and very good uh, training program. Uh, they even had a potty trainer. I'm not a. I'm not going to go into how that worked, but <laughs> but it shows the uh, the incredible thoroughness of NASA's training program. It really truly was uh, world class. But uh, I'm trying to. <laughs> well, yeah, 
blindside me with some stories I could tell. I'd have to think a little bit to to come up with some uh, uh, some funny ones. But uh, we were always uh, pulling jokes on each other, doing things that uh, I remember the robot arm. I was training one time with the robot arm, and and Judy Resnick was uh, coming in for a training program, and it had the camera on the end of it, and I was down there like she was coming in and I was uh, had a camera and she was seeing me uh, well she saw the camera she knew I was up there operating this thing and she was laughing about that uh, you know uh, knowing that I was up there uh, I wish I could have talked to her and I would have said something but she was she was uh, laughing about the idea of this big robot arm you know going around looking like some type of science fiction uh, creature that was uh, surveying the area uh, but we had we had a lot of laughs uh, no question about it Awesome. So, okay, this is the most obvious question. This is kind of a softball question. What was the sensation of actually flying in space like? Did you find it enjoyable? And, you know, would you do it again if, say, Elon called you on the phone and said, hey, Mike, come on? <laughs> I would definitely, again. I would definitely uh, take a ride on uh, Elon's uh, Falcon Dragon combination. No, no question about it. Uh, but, First of all, getting into space is scary. Uh, I will admit it. I wouldn't have admitted it actively uh, with, uh, when I was there. Astronauts were very uh, introverted about, or uh, you know, a little bit reticent about admitting the fear factor of being out on that launch pad, but it was severe, uh, no, no question. But at the same time, as I tell people, when you're on that launch pad, you fear for your life, that fear is on you. But at the same time, you are boundlessly joyful. I know that's hard to get your head around, but fear and joy, overwhelming fear. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, gut fear and overwhelming joy is what you experience out there. Joy that you're going to have this lifetime dream come true. As far as getting into space or you know, once you're in orbit, um, obviously the views are, are make any anything you have to endure make it worth it. What, looking at the, at the world from a couple hundred miles up is so incredibly beautiful. Um, but there is a downside to it. Uh, about half the astronauts uh, get space sickness. Uh, nobody knows what causes that. They never have figured it out. But it is not, and, and by that I mean it's a uh, nausea. Uh, some people vomiting for, well, some people can do it for up to a week or more uh, if it's not treated. Um, they do, when I was flying, they didn't treat it. They were afraid to give us drugs. But then uh, later they gave up on trying other ways and they just put on industrial strength anti nausea. Uh, drugs to uh, give people if they happen to happen to get nauseous, but it wasn't correlated to earth motion sickness. That was a little bit uh, bizarre, and that's what makes it so hard for the doctors to figure out what caused it. And I and I was a I'm a classic example of that. I have been sick in the back of those F four Phantom jets countless times. I mean countless. I, I kept the barf bag factories rolling when I was flying in, in uh, tactical jets. And uh, yet, uh, I fully expected to get sick in orbit, and I never did. Never had the slightest nausea. And then um, we've had test pilots that have never been motion sick in their life fly up in space, and they'll be affected uh, uh, by uh, this space sickness. So it's it's just a weird thing. Nobody can figure out what really causes it. Uh, but like I said, they now carry up uh, injectable drugs that uh, a person can get to you know knock down that that nausea. Uh, another thing that happens is that fluid shift. We have a lot of blood and fluid in our bodies that's equally distributed up in weightlessness, and that causes your uh, face to swell, get a little bit uh, puffy in the face, but it makes your waist and thighs and calves skinnier, uh, fills out your arms. Uh, but the downside of that is also causes the discs of your of your spine to absorb more fluid and, and swell, and that pushes your vertebrae apart and makes you taller. I was an inch and a half taller in space than I am now. Problem with that is it gives you a severe lower back ache. Uh, most astronauts complain of a very low, very bad lower back ache because the muscles of the lower back don't stretch right away to make room for that longer spine. And so you get a terrific back ache. And that takes, I, I mean, I my longest mission was a week and uh, and I still had a back ache when I landed. It rapidly went away after being on Earth. But uh, uh, there, I've talked to people who have been up on a space station, and they say it's usually about a month in before they finally, their body finally has it acclimated fully to wow. uh, to weightlessness as far as, uh, you know, no aches, pains, uh, nausea, anything like that. So uh, it's, it, it makes it uncomfortable, but trust me, 
just look out the window and you forget about back aches and you forget about everything when you look at, at that window of at Earth. It is so incredibly beautiful. Awesome. So finally, this is the last question. Finally, there are a lot of people out there uh, who would love to fly in space, all all ages, you know, from kids to you know older people. Any advice for them? Well, <laughs> winning the lottery would make it easy. Uh, you could buy your ride into space then, but uh, lacking that, um, you know, it's it it's so obviously there's just not that many opportunities uh, to become a NASA astronaut and uh, or you know be an astronaut for uh, uh, Blue Origin or for SpaceX or any of these other startups that might be coming along. Uh, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. I mean, if that's a passion, uh, get the get the education you need uh, to be competitive for it. And uh, the thing about it, there's no downside to that in the sense that if you get that education and you apply and you're not selected, you still have positioned yourself to be, you know, imminently employable with uh, backgrounds in science and uh, engineering, and uh, and be fulfilled. If if your passion is space, you'll be fulfilled in 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 working on rockets or doing a, or a robot probes going to distant planets. Uh, uh, you'll be fulfilled with that. So I would just encourage everybody to hammer away at their education. Make sure uh, early on you probably ought to look at the uh, medical requirements that are being required. There's no reason to get your hopes up about being an astronaut if you can look right away and see that there's some medical defect that you have that would prevent you from doing that. But again, I would say, hey, even if it prevents you from doing flying in space, it wouldn't prevent you from supporting the space operations. Uh, as an engineer, as a scientist, I would encourage you to do that. Excellent. Well, that's all I have. And thank you so much for joining me this morning. Okay, Emily. Hey, what? Well, uh, <clears throat> I assume you're going to cut the recording now. Yeah. I... <laughs> that was fantastic, Emily. That was really good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, he's he's a lot of fun. Um, I think we're going to have a great time with him in New Mexico. He, he's he's absolutely a, a, just a joy to talk to and and just a lot of fun and has a lot of insight into um, what what it's like, you know. But I, I, I but I I mean, he mentioned some of the non fun parts about going to space, but overall, it's very, very um, positive, I think, you know, because he you know, he said once you see what the world looks like and how exquisitely beautiful our planet is. You forget about anything else, you know? And, and I think, you know, and, and like, you know, Charles brought up earlier that that really speaks to the overview effect. I think once people, you know, get past the trauma of launch and past, you know, other, maybe not yeah. so pleasant things about astronaut training and things like that, you know, it's not all fun and games, um, you know, once they see the earth from that distance, it's just, it, it makes sense, you know? So, yeah. 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 Well, that was incredibly fascinating. I, I, I can't wait to be in his presence in New Mexico. I think he's going to be a very, very energetic, uh, and entertaining, uh, guest. probably one of our, our, our better, all of our astronaut guests have been fantastic, but you know, I, I'm always looking for, uh, more insight into that, uh, that effect. Uh, that was you mentioned, Charles. Charles, well, what do you got? A couple of things. Notice that, like every one of them. Oh yeah, I'd go back. I'd get on the Falcon yeah. Nine. I'd go. Yeah, and also, yeah. always the and the view um, uh, emphasis. So, uh, not surprising. Uh, and someone who clearly just had a joy in his chosen profession which is yeah. uh, not everyone gets to have that. So if you have that, it's, it's very special. Yeah. Yeah. I was well, thinking I, I'm happy that. To... Hey, go ahead, Charlie. I'm sorry. I was about to change the subject. So go ahead. Yeah. Mark, if you had something yeah. I know. I was about to say, I, I have that uh, effect. I love my job. It's interesting, but I was really, really focused on the, uh, the, <laughs> the barfing section of his uh, discussion and, and, <laughs> You know, I, I love roller coasters. I've handled roller coasters, but I do know when that fear kicks in on me at that specific moment on a roller coaster. I mean, how bad can it be, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, I'm sorry. I know Charles um, wants to go to another topic, but 
I yeah. will add that what Mike said about some people um, who are like these trained jet pilots who are used to taking 12 G's at a time get sick. Yeah. That's absolutely right. There's no way you can predict space sickness. Um, there are some astronauts who flew like Thunderbirds, you know, the the thunder, yeah, the, sure. the shows. And those are nuts if you've ever seen those. And they got to space. Oh, yeah. You'd think they were the last person to get sick and they were the first person to get sick. There's no yeah. way to predict it. It's just your body is in a new environment that it's never been in. That's why. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would be honored to, uh, you know, vomit with the best of them. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Okay, Charlie. <laughs> what do you got, man? <laughs> um, well, I, I'd like us to talk a little bit about um, New Mexico, the space state, for those folks who are coming here. Uh, and perhaps for those who are coming here who've never been here before. Um, mm -hmm. It's really amazing um, the nexus between, you know, we all think about Florida and to some extent California as the, the big space states. But New Mexico really beginning with Roswell, or Roswell, with, yeah, with Goddard near Roswell, New Mexico, uh, with these early rocketry experiments uh, has been at the forefront of space exploration. Listening to Mike, I, I was reminded of the one of the early space shuttle flights landed here in White Sands. They called it Space Harbor then as an alternative shuttle landing zone. But in between, you've got the White Sands Missile Range uh, very near Las Cruces, which is essentially, I don't know, it looks like a third of the state. <laughs> when you look at it, the central part of New Mexico is wide open because it was a U.S. Army uh, missile range. They brought the Von Braun V2s here to see if they could make them work and flew them into the middle of the desert. And um, there's a great uh, museum at White Sand Wismer, as the, sure. the people that work there call it. We actually, in the mid 80s, flew some commercial rockets out of White Sands Missile Range because there was no Spaceport America. Spaceport America has been bubbling around as a concept for decades before uh, Sir Richard romance to Governor Richardson into ponying up a nearly a quarter of a billion New Mexico tax dollars to build the first purpose-built commercial spaceport here. And while it hasn't um, lived up to the schedule promises of those who built it, it's still an amazing location. And our mm -hmm. guests have a unique opportunity to visit this range. It will be getting very busy in the coming years. It's already an active launch range. And it's, it's amazing to see what a quarter of a billion dollars dumped on the New Mexican desert right next to the journey of death uh, pathway um, built. You also have the New Mexico Museum of Space History in Alamogordo, where yeah, much of Alamogordo. this is captured. Yeah. You have the, um, in Socorro, for anybody that saw the movie Alien, you have those 50-some dishes that all point simultaneously at the same direction and, and listen. You have Los Alamos uh, Lab, where a lot of nuclear uh, space stuff has gone on. Um, it's just an amazing confluence for being such a beautiful, I loved it so much I moved here a few months ago, but a beautiful and empty uh, location uh, meets, you know, this is the place the world goes to space from. And most people don't know it. Uh, they have something called the New Mexico Space Trail, which you can, uh, I'm sure you can Google and uh, just, you know, and, and oft times people who come to our launches 
two things are true. They're space geeks themselves, hence mm -hmm. they've chosen our service for a loved one. And secondly, they come to these events with some more time. You know, in the case of our Florida events, they go do the Florida stuff. Yep. Uh, in the case of our New Mexico events, besides all the New Mexico space stuff, again, you have a just an amazing, it's just a different state from any of the other ones that I've been in. And yeah. if you like it, you love it. Um, I was uh, at a Melissa Etheridge concert at the Santa Fe Opera uh, a mm -hmm. month or so ago. And mm -hmm. as she came on stage, she said, ah, Santa Fe, you all know why you live here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, I, I have to echo, echo those sentiments, Charlie. Uh, when I attended my first launch with you guys out there, it was literally, I mean, I hate to use the word in a negative uh, aspect of another planet, but um, the, the landscape alone, the, the terrain, you know, it's nothing I've ever seen before in my entire life. Just white sands. I remember doing uh, one of the launches there. Um, we had uh, a Huey come over from White Sands Missile Range. I think they were loaded up with uh, military officials just to see our launch. That was amazing. Uh, I've seen white sand beaches here in Florida, but to see a white sand desert, that is oh, yeah. mind blowing. You yeah. know? Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, it's we're, beautiful. yeah, we, we, we love to be able to tell folks uh, here's some other things you can do. Uh, of course, the the main reason everybody comes is to celebrate the life of a, of a loved one and to send that loved one on a journey um, where there's weightlessness, there's view, there's everything that you could hope for uh, for your loved one. And it's just about the coolest memorial service that you can go to. Um, agreed, agreed. But it's a great, great location to come to. I started coming here in the uh, mid 1980s when we were first. We launched the first ever F FAA licensed commercial space flight from yeah. White Sands Museum in or White Museum from White Sands Missile Range in um, uh, in the mid 1980s, and just you know loved it. And uh, you mentioned the landscape. I got to say the colors. You just yeah, don't colors, see yeah. colors uh, that, that yeah. you see out. So what are the colors? I know you, guys, you both are looking forward to visiting me out here in my adopted state. And uh, we are well, looking. I'm going to I'm going to concentrate more on Emily's face uh, during that time <laughs> out there. You know, I, I really want to see reactions um, to where you are. Uh, at that time, which is totally spectacular. I've yeah, been to Tucson and I've been to other, like I've been to, you know, the Middle East deserts and stuff like that, but I've never, I've never been to New Mexico. So this will be right. a, a big trip for me. I, I, I couldn't be more excited to see a yeah. rocket launch out there. I've seen rocket launches at, you know, Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral. Sure. They're cool, yeah. but yep. I think this is going to be a little different. So yeah, 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 real. Uh, real quick before we end this broadcast, um, if anyone has any questions right now, and I want you to get them in now, and if, if there's anything you have uh, that you'd like to know, you need information on, if you're, you're, you're not sure of what it is you heard during this broadcast, uh, number one, these broadcasts are rebroadcast, okay? So you'll be able to catch them again on, on YouTube. Uh, Facebook will still have a link somewhere that you can click. And you can go ahead, and, and some people say, uh, or, or some people rather watch these broadcasts after they've been broadcast. So I get it, your dinner hour, you, you have other things to do, you have to shop, whatever, and then you come back and you pick up on it. That doesn't mean you won't get an answer for any questions you may have, even though you can't ask it live at the time. Uh, ask a question, contact us, call us, email us, the whole nine yards. We know the trip is coming uh, up quickly, so just please make sure that you have all your ducks in a row. You know what to expect, you know what to do, you know what to bring, you know what to, car to carry. Um, oh, good question uh, for you, Charles, here. Sure. Um, rocket from liftoff to landing is under 30 minutes. Um, it's probably about 
maybe as much as 10 minutes to get to Apogee, which is the highest, uh, uh, which is into space over 72 nautical miles. And then uh, parachutes back. And depending upon how long uh, before we have to depart the launch, we may see the helicopter actually take off to go pick up the the capsule. Um, so um, it's about a half hour of action, and the good part is it's all carried out uh, and, and announced by the mission control folks at up. So you get the file. They tell you when it's in space. They tell you when the parachute's deployed. So it, it it's it's a fun thing. The yeah, it, it, predominant it, it, reason. Okay. I was going to say, Maria also asked what else was on board. Uh, yeah. A wide variety of NASA flight opportunity experiments, a few of which are quite, um, they're not, yeah, I don't think they're classified and that NASA doesn't do anything classified, but closely held uh, secrets uh, about what's flying on this one. But they're all NASA approved and NASA funded payloads with the exception of i believe there's also an international payload on board because i know that they've been dealing with the uh, itar folks um uh for uh, uh bringing the payload into to the rocket um wow. got another question about yeah. destiny uh still looking at at q4 2023 uh might move. There's not been an official move of that schedule yet. Payload will be weightless for about six to seven minutes. That's a long time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> where's my bag? <laughs> That's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, once again, uh, anyone else have any questions? Uh, thank you, Maria. I hope the to see you out there. I'm assuming you're planning to come. It would be nice if you are, um, but it'd be nice to see a lot of families. That's one of the great things that I like about uh, these launches that you, you you end up with great friends after the fact. Um, you're there for a singularity, but you walk away with phone numbers and email addresses because it is a three-day event. So it's not like you're there for the launch and you go back home. No, we have you know some, some activities, some things planned. Uh, while you're there. Thank you, Maria, for that answer to that. Can't wait to meet you. Um, and go ahead, Emily, please. Yeah, one thing I do have to end, I know we have like a couple minutes left, but um, yep, there is, if you go to YouTube, and Charles put me on this video, he, 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 he's the one who told me about this video. There is an awesome video. I think it's by the people at GoPro. They actually put a GoPro on the Up Aerospace Space, La uh, Space Loft XL rocket for one of the uh suborbital flights and i believe it was also a celestial flight as well oh, yes. and um, they recorded the entire thing and this footage is just like i've watched this th i've watched this clip probably about 30 times i mean it is just mind-blowing you get to see space you see the earth from that high apogee you know just i mean it is just if you go on youtube i think if you type in up aerospace gopro um you should yeah. be able to find it and it is just just watch it you got to watch it i've probably watched it a bunch of times and it doesn't get old that's but that's the kind of rocket that there we're we're gonna have up in a few days which is okay. awesome that's awesome uh, maria your answer to the dress code has already been answered by all celeste's uh staff members but i'll go ahead for everyone who um uh, it'll be chilly It'll be chilly because we'll be out there before dawn on the New Mexico desert. So bring okay. warm clothes for the for the desert. Otherwise, people are fairly casual. Some people dress up a little bit for the memorial service, but it's basically a comfortable launch event. And uh, yeah, this hey point, Charlie, we normally get um, yeah we normally get a rocket up still in the early morning hours though. So um, oh. As the, the sun comes up, we'll get warmer, but we'll probably be over by then. Is that correct? A little bit. I mean, it, it warm, you know, 
the rocket will fly around 8.30 and it'll still yep. be okay. chilly. <laughs> so also we're getting questions. Uh, here's a question about how far in advance will we get info for lodging, et cetera, for tranquility and enterprise. The minute there's a launch date set, we will be out to you with information. Right now, it's just a it's a flow. <laughs> the launch yeah. date kind of looks like like this. Right. But the minute if you're on our list, if you're a family member, you'll get boom immediately. We always post the launch date first on the website, and then we'll follow with a broader announcement and our social. Um, uh, media platforms. I think there was one other one there. Yeah, Can talking about broadcasting our flights. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. So we'll make an announcement about this. Um, we probably won't be doing a immediate live broadcast. There's some, again, there's some issues with the providers about when they want to release it. But we will have the only video of the launch available. Um, as near to the launch date uh, time, we'll do it obviously on the same date, but we're still working the details of it, but you will be able to see the launch. The memorial service will be live. So um, your uh, celebration of your brother-in-law's flight uh, at the Las Cruces Convention Center will be a live stream. And the online is just whatever our launch providers and Spaceport America tell us we can do. Uh, so it may be a, a little bit after it flies that we'll post the video of it flying. <coughs> right. Um, bear in mind, folks, that we are in the New Mexico desert. Uh, there, there are mountains all around us. So um, we will definitely work hard in trying to get you uh, immediate coverage as soon as we know we're, we, we have everything uh, worked out. We just, it, we've done it before, so uh, just keep your fingers crossed that we'll provide again. Um, this will be our 19th. It will be our 19th mission. Um, and we, we always want to recognize the folks that make it possible. And by that, I mean the providers, our staff, but most importantly, those of you who choose our service for your loved one or yourself. Uh, yeah. makes a yeah. uh, makes it all possible. And we love hosting our families at the launch. It's a life changing event for people. You can, you know, you can see it on video. You can talk about the effect, but you really kind of have to feel it. And um, yep. that's, that's transformative for so many people. They, they, can't tell you the number of people that say, you know, I didn't know what to expect, but this is the coolest thing. I'm so glad I chose it for mom kind of thing. So, yep, we will be on again in two weeks. Okay. Which is with our pre one week to flight briefing update, whatever people want to know. Very so, important. Yeah. We'll be, and we'll let you know that we'll be on in two weeks, but again, We'll be at, well, in, in, in two weeks, we'll be, uh, what, nine days That's from 20, now? Yeah, what is that, the 21st? Yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please, uh, everyone that's watching this broadcast and anyone who you know could not watch this broadcast, spread this around. 21st is very, 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 very important. You'd be surprised how many people – uh, we hear that said, I didn't know that. Uh, I could watch at the time. Do what you can to get all the information passed on to all your loved ones or anyone else that's attending uh, this launch so you're not caught blindsided. Um, it's going to be incredible. It's a very, very emotional uh, moment for everyone, not just family members, but staff involved. What we do is very heartfelt and emotional for us, too. So you'll see that on our faces as well. Uh, as your 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 loved one. So once again, next live broadcast is Monday, November 21st. Please do not miss this. Please do not miss this broadcast in two weeks, folks. Uh, in two weeks. Um, I guess we need to thank, uh, not need to, we definitely will, without doubt, thank uh, Emily, our, our uh, Celeste's uh, online content provider here, who did a fabulous job with that interview with uh, our, our keynote speaker, uh, in New Mexico, which I'm so excited to meet this guy. I'm really excited to meet this guy. 
Um, so thank you, Emily, for coming up with that. Charles, as always, we love you, brother. You're fantastic. We, we, we worship you. We appreciate you, everything that you do for the family members and even make your staff happy to be a part of this is, is well uh, recognized. So um, thank, you. thank you on this. Uh, two weeks is going to come up fast, guys. So don't think um, it, it's you got a lot of time. No, put it on your calendar right now. In two weeks, we'll be back and you're going to hear a lot more uh, from us. Any final words from anyone or is that it? <laughs> nope. <you> know. <laughs> okay. Guys, go. good night. Bye. Have a great Thank rest you. of your week. We'll see you in 14 days. All right. See you. Bye. See you guys. This is the launch conductor in um, Mission Control. We, we pause at this moment in our countdown to remember and honor the lives of each of the participants on the Celestis Memorial space flight. Their presence on this flight signifies a commitment to the opening of the space frontier shared by all of us. We wish the friends and families present today and all those who are with us in spirit all over the world, Godspeed, good luck, and our thanks for allowing us to share this very personal time with you today. LCL. Five vehicles armed, three, two, one, fire.